probably advance it. Right? Yeah, that's kind of hard to It's a little annoying. Do I know anybody out there? Uh, <laughs> you can't tell. We're going to begin. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Economic Perspectives on Innovation and IP Policy panel. This is the last panel of the day. I am Jay Ezri Elif from the FTC. I am an economic advisor to Chairman Simons. Uh, hello, I'm Julie Carlson. I'm an economist in our Bureau of Economics here at the FTC. Uh, we'll be your moderators for this panel. And before we begin, we want to give the standard uh, disclaimer. To the extent that we as moderators express any views, those views are our own and not that of the commission. Uh, we'd like to welcome people uh, who are just tuning in to this panel uh, or just coming in uh, to watch this panel. And a special thank you to those of you who have stuck around all day and watched a full day of uh, hearings. Your reward for sticking around is hearing six economists have a very thoughtful discussion on the economics of innovation. We have a very distinguished panel of economists uh, today to discuss the economics of innovation in IP. I'm going to give very brief introductions. So Rich Gilbert is an uh, emeritus professor of economics at the University of Berkeley and my former colleague at Compass Lexicon. Uh, Jim Besson is executive director of the Technology <coughs> and Policy Re Research Initiative and a lecturer at uh, Boston University uh, School of Law. Michael Frakes is professor of law and economics at Duke University School of Law. And uh, Anne-Lane Farrar is vice president at Charles River Associates and also my former colleague at Compass Lexicon. So um, we're going to have a discussion on lots of topics today, but we will, um, kick off the, the discussion where a panelist will give an opening five minute presentation uh, and after that we'll have a pa panel discussion. Our, our colleagues from the FTC will be coming around and collecting audience questions. So please uh, write down your best questions and we hope to have time to cover these questions at the end of the panel. So we're going to kick things off uh, with Rich Gilbert, who will be speaking about antitrust and innovation. Well, thanks, Jay. Um, I'm happy to be able to address uh, these hearings and also uh, uh, kudos to the commission for continuing to um, have hearings and collect information and input that's relevant to your enforcement mission. Um, so now, uh, our topic is, is innovation and in intellectual property today. It goes well with the 21st century theme of the conference. And a uh, common perception is that antitrust enforcement is up to the task of promoting competition in innovative industries. Uh, that was the conclusion, for example, of the Antitrust Modernization Commission. Uh, most people, when I ask most people, um, you know, can the, are the antitrust laws of uh, adequate for uh, addressing innovation issues? Does anything need to be changed? Most people say, no, they're fine. Just leave them as is. Uh, I, and it's true that the antitrust laws are very flexible. The Sherman Act doesn't say much about uh, either Section 1 or Section 2 standards. Uh, Clayton Act doesn't say a whole lot more. Uh, but um, I think the, the view that nothing really needs to change is, is actually not correct. And there are many obstacles to effective antitrust enforcement for innovation. 
Um, first of all is, is the obvious uh, point that um, antitrust policy has evolved over the past 100 years with a focus on short-term consumer welfare. In many respects, this is sort of a victory for economists who've been saying, you know, it's all about consumer welfare and allocative efficiency. Uh, but at the same time, a focus on allocative efficiency, which is really price cost margins, is not necessarily the right, uh, uh, right objective if the purpose is to provide incentives for dynamic competition. Uh, and it's also curious, anyone who's looked at the history of the antitrust laws, uh, and there's nothing about consumer welfare and allocative efficiency in the history of the Sherman Act. Uh, if anything, the Sherman Act was about uh, promoting uh, uh, the ability of uh, lots of firms to compete in, in a context where there were large uh, trusts, um, not terribly unlike the situation we face today. Um, now, there are other challenges, somewhat technical, that are nonetheless very important. Uh, one is the uh, strong emphasis in antitrust enforcement on uh, market definition. And again, there was market definition was not written into the Sherman Act, but it quick, quickly got included there. Uh, many economists, I would say almost all economists these days, if I can speak for the profession, and even many lawyers have been pushing back against market definition uh, as a necessary predicate for antitrust enforcement. Uh, even the, the latest version of the horizontal merger guidelines uh, kind of subtly takes this view by inverting the positions of uh, uh, competitive analysis and market definition. It used to be market definition first, followed by competitive analysis, and now it's now it's switched. Uh, and that's a real problem for innovation. Um, why, first of all, uh, with a few narrow exceptions of contract research and development, R&D is not traded in a market. So if you want to talk, even though the IP guidelines talk about a research and development market, uh, we know it's not a market in the usual sense of trade. Uh, and, and that's a problem if you follow the precedent in, in the law. Uh, the other problem is that, um, uh, you know, in effect, innovation effects, whether you're talking about actually uh, promoting R&D or whether you're talking about promoting future competition in product markets, uh, it's just very hard to define these markets, um, uh, particularly in a world where there's a high standard uh, for proof. Uh, increasingly, in merger cases, we want to see things like difference and difference analysis and, you know, really getting down to very precise effects. Well, those are, those are hard to do when you're talking about markets that may not even exist yet. Uh, or if they <coughs> do exist, you don't know what the competition's going to be a few years from, from now. Uh, and you know, that doesn't mean that these things aren't important. You know, another problem is that you might have a situation where the effects are to advance or retard, uh, delay competition. Uh, and that's, that's a big issue as well. So, well, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, the hook here on having to finish up. Uh, I think we'll be able to talk about a lot of other these issues, but my own point, and I really want to get to divestitures and, and innovation remedies at some point, uh, but my own point is that we've been just a little bit too optimistic about antitrust and innovation and our ability to use antitrust policy to solve innovation concerns. Thank you, um, Rich. Next, we have Jim Besson. Thanks for having me. Uh, as many of you, I assume, know, uh, industry concentration has been rising in the U.S. This is a graph of, for the manufacturing sector of the top, the market share of the top four firms since the 1980s. It's gone up about 5%. And similar graphs could be seen in every, every major sector of the economy, services, wholesale, retail. Um, Many people look at a graph like this and assume it means that competition is declining and that this is a real challenge for antitrust policy. I'm gonna suggest that it's actually something different. It's not about competition declining, but it, it poses a major challenge for IP policy. 
I have a, an analysis, and I, and I can go into it in detail later if there's interest, um, but what's actually causing most of the increase uh, in, in U.S. industries outside of big tech are major investments in proprietary information technology. Think about Walmart's investments in its logistics and, and, and information systems that allow it to be highly efficient and as a result have allowed it to uh, grow much faster than its rivals and come to dominate uh, the general merchandise uh, market. Uh, we're seeing similar investments in all areas of the economy by top firms uh, to the tune of $250 billion a year. Uh, that's almost as much as firms invent, invest in uh, tangible uh, capital net of uh, depreciation. So it's a very, you know, a very large investment being made and it's paying off in terms of increased productivity. Well, that sounds like good news. Well, why would that be a problem? Um, so the problem is that the productivity is growing for the top firms in the economy, uh, but not for everybody else. So this graph shows, the, the red line shows the productivity of the top, top 50 public firms, and it's continued to grow up go up at a, at, a, at a good rate after 2000, uh, much faster than the productivity of the, the, all of the rest of the firms. And, and you have to ask, well, what's going on there? In a sense, there is a diffusion gap that the new technologies are being developed, but in contrast to the way things worked in the past, they're spreading to the rest of the economy more slowly. The rest of the firms are being left behind. And this has uh, significant economic consequences in terms of things like average productivity. Um, this is true not just in the U.S., but in the OECD nations generally. The OECD has a report showing a productivity gap growing across developed nations. So it's, it's not just an issue of U.S. Uh, antitrust policy that's, that's causing these changes. So wh why is this significant? And the significance has to do with the, 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 the importance of sequential innovation. We tend to focus when we think about innovation about the, the big inventions, the first inventions. So the, the power loom, for instance, was a, a great invention which powered the uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, the, the, from the hand loom to the first power loom in the U.S., uh, it increased the output per worker over two times. Uh, th that was tremendously important, and, and like I said, it helped spur the Industrial Revolution. But that was really only a small part of the productivity growth that came related to the power loom. So if you look over a 100-year period, that initial doubling was, is really very small compared to what happened in, in the century that followed. There was this sequential innovation, and, and it consisted of uh, two main things. One was the development of a skilled labor force who knew how to use these technologies, such as the power loom, in, in an efficient, more and more efficient way. And many of those people also became tinkerers, and relating to the, the, the second cause, which was the, uh, the series of incremental improvements, incremental inventions, which uh, or sequential in innovations uh, which allowed productivity to continue to improve. So when we have a situation where technologies are not diffusing or not spreading, we are cutting short this, this pattern of uh, important sequential innovation. Um, so wh what does this say about policy? Um, in general, IP policy needs to balance the in incentives that we provide for providing the initial innovations with the incentives we provide for diffusing those inventions and sharing them and, and the associated knowledge. And what the, that growing productivity gap suggests is that we have a less optimal balance today than we had in, in, in the year 2000 because things seem not to be spreading as rapidly. Um, what, it, what policy is not the only factor I should emphasize. A lot of this may be simply the technology. We're dealing with new sorts of information technologies. These are complex systems. They may be more difficult to spread in a way. But there are, there is a body of evidence suggesting there are policy areas that do affect the rate of diffusion. In patents, we're, we're talking largely here in information technologies so or software patents. We have some evidence that uh, software patents reduce the rate of sequential innovation from Glasso and Shankerman. We have several studies now that have looked at the impact of uh, patent assertion entities or popularly pop patent trolls uh, and their litigation and that these reduce R&D, particularly for smaller firms. Uh, 
Another policy area is employee non-compete agreements. We've seen a tremendous spread of these. Um, they, we have good evidence now that they reduce labor mobility, they reduce entrepreneurship. Another area closely related is uh, the inevitable disclosure doctrine in trade secret law. Uh, and again, we have some good economic studies which are now showing that these reduce labor mobility and reduce innovation. So these are some policy areas where uh, policy in some cases seems to be going against diffusion, making it more difficult or slowing the spread of new ideas. Uh, these are some things we need to think about in, in the bigger picture of innovation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, next up, we have Michael Frakes. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to speak in somewhat broad terms regarding what we have learned from the economics literature on the fundamental question uh, of whether patent systems incentivize innovation. To begin, as many of us are aware, you know, we may be concerned that uh, new ideas may be under-incentivized given that ideas take on characteristics of public goods. Uh, one of the chief promises of the patent system is that by allowing innovators to earn rents through exclusion rights, uh, people and firms may be willing to innovate and overcome free riding concerns. But have we actually seen this promise met in practice? At the outset, I should say that any attempt to empirically uh, approach this question with confidence encounters notable obstacles, uh, arguably the most challenging of which is the construction of the necessary counterfactual. That is, to be able to effectively compare the extent and type of innovation uh, we would see in a system without patent rights uh, if we could also observe that same system with such rights. Uh, one line of research produced by the Economics Academy that I uh, perhaps turn to most when thinking about uh, this question is that from Professor Petra Moser. Uh, for these purposes, Petra looked at uh, so mid-late 19th century uh, in Northern Europe, a time where this region was characterized by notable heterogeneity across countries and the strength and existence uh, of their patent systems, but where this heterogeneity is what economists would call plausibly exogenous, uh, as it was perhaps driven by various uh, political traditions rather than by characteristics of the innovation environment. This provided Professor uh, Moser with the means to sort of make comparisons across different IP regimes. Um, and in a very clever fashion, she acquired data on innovative uh, activity by turning to records of innovation exhibits at two of the major world's fairs uh, at the time. So the following is just a, a brief summary of the, her findings from this really interesting work. First, uh, countries without patent protection at that time still had very high rates of innovative activity. Second, across all innovations uh, at the fairs, uh, only a small portion were reported to be patented. That being said, uh, there was a relationship between whether an innovation was patented uh, and whether the innovation won a prize based on its level of usefulness and quality. So while patent systems may not have been major drivers of innovation levels, patents may have led to higher quality inventions. But it is her, uh, her next set of findings that I actually find most interesting from her work. Uh, in countries without patents, we see a greater focus on innovation in industries where secrecy operates uh, as an effective alternative to patents, uh, mainly in industries with innovations that are harder to reverse engineer. Uh, or as in countries with patent protection, we saw a greater amount of innovative activity in industries where secrecy was arguably less effective. Um, so I'd say that the bottom line from this, is anal from this analysis is that patents do seem to play a role at least in shaping the direction uh, of technological growth. Now I perhaps have two concerns with this discussion thus far. You know, first we're talking about innovative activity from a very long time ago. Um, and as you know, Jim mentioned, you know, we're also speaking, uh, to get to the idea of sequential innovation. So far I've just been speaking about innovation in rather broad terms, perhaps you know, combining both notions of isolated standalone innovation and follow on cumulative innovation. When the reality is when we sort of look at innovative activity today, perhaps much of it is truly cumulative uh, in nature in the sense that existing technologies uh, may be inputs into newer technologies, which raises a more specific question for our literature. You know, uh, you know, what effect do patents have on follow-on uh, innovation? Now, this question has been uh, the subject of uh, much theoretical literature, uh, which I won't discuss in the interest of time, but from what I gather from this theoretical work, there really is a lot of ambiguity surrounding this question. So I think at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, it really is you know, quite an empirical question. Uh, and so what have we learned from the empirical literature? Well, let me just uh, turn briefly to two very nicely done recent studies, one of which uh, uh, Jim had just alluded to. Uh, but first is a forthcoming study by Heidi Williams and, and Bob, Sam Bob and Sampit uh, that, bo uh, that look at the effect of whether a patent is granted on human genes uh, on follow-on scientific research and follow-on commercial research investments. Uh, Williams and Sampet are also very mindful of the need I raised above to sort of develop a convincing counterfactual environment uh, 
And the quasi-experimental uh, framework that they take is, is really quite clever. They rely on what is effectively a uh, random assignment of patent applications to examiners combined with heterogeneity uh, and the leniency of examiners to, to really produce what is, in effect, you know, randomization and whether uh, applications are granted or not. So taking this approach, uh, professors William and Sampet, uh, Williams and Sampet essentially find really no meaningful effect uh, uh, of patents on follow-on innovation, at least in this gene context. And that raises the question about what about other contexts. And here, I think it's perhaps helpful to turn to recent research by uh, professors uh, Alberto Galasso and Mark Shank Shankerman, which Jim had just mentioned. Uh, in effect, they're actually taking a very similar uh, methodological approach to that taken by Williams and Sampet, uh, but instead they're looking at what happens when courts invalidate patents, uh, creating the necessary counter counterfactual by drawing on random assignment uh, of judges and judge heterogeneity um, and, and patent invalidation rates. Their findings uh, are interesting, uh, but need a little bit more explanation. Uh, they find that patents impede follow-on uh, innovation, but only in very specific scenarios. For instance, they find that patent invalidations have a significant impact on cumulative innovation in the fields of computers and communications, electronics, and medical instruments, but they find no effect for drugs, uh, chemical, or uh, uh, mechanical technologies. Additionally, they show that their entire findings are actually driven by one specific scenario, you know, the amount of innovative activity by small innovators uh, increases when patents by larger firms are invalidated. So the bottom line is there is some, perhaps some evidence that patents may in fact impede follow-on uh, innovation, though only in uh, select uh, circumstances. I'm gonna stop there for now. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next up we have uh, Anne and uh, Lane Farrar. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a per very particular kind of player in the marketplace, and that is a form of PAE, patent assertion entity. Um, there's a, one aspect of a PAE that's referred to as a privateer or less pejoratively an, a hybrid PAE, and these are patent assertion entities that maintain a financial back end with the patent assigner. These were not covered in the FTC's case study that was released in 2016. It's a, it's a, a narrower subset of the PAEs. And the claim in the theoretical literature is that these entities impose an innovation tax on whatever industry they're operating in. The arguments are similar to those made for PAEs in general, but with some specifics added. For example, that in addition to acquiring and asserting low quality patents for nuisance value settlements, they also target the practicing entity from whom they've received the patent as a means of raising rivals' costs, which is an antitrust issue. Until now, however, there hasn't been any empirical work. It's all been legal and theoretical. Um, my co-authors and I have the first round of our research on uh, quantitatively um, testing some of these implications uh, coming out in the next few months in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Uh, so very briefly, just a thumbnail sketch of what we found in this first round of research, and that is at least from the quality, patent quality uh, perspective of the theory, we are not finding support for the claim that these entities are acquiring low quality patents to assert for nuisance value. Instead, the, uh, an objective um, patent measures, patent quality measures that are accepted in the economics literature we find that the privateers are acquiring patents that look like other litigated patents in some technology areas, even higher quality than other litigated patents or other PAE held patents. Um, certainly, the odds of a patent being held by a privateer increase with both the scope of the patent and certain quality measures. And not surprisingly, uh, not differentiating this theory or any other theory, the odds of a patent being litigated are higher when they're in the hands of a privateer. That's consistent both with this antitrust tax on innovation theory as well as other theories such as these are just profit maximizing entities who create an intermediary uh, or liquidity within the marketplace, so it's not a differentiating factor. And lastly, we've just begun to look at litigation timing and we've found thus far that privateers, patents held by a privateer experience their first litigation event later than patents held by others. Now that could either be because the privateer is holding on to a patent longer as a means of raising the damages over time, which would be consistent with an innovation tax theory, 
or it could be simply that the reassignment process takes a while to work out and that once in the hands of the hybrid PAE, assertion is relatively quick after that. That's something we're investigating now. But thus far, uh, at least one aspect of the tax um, innovation tax theory is not uh, uh, confirmed with an empirical look, and that is the quality piece. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. And so next we'll kick off the panel discussion, and the first question is for Rich. Rich, uh, you spoke about the need to uh, look at incentives to innovate in antitrust analysis. But here the big challenge is how do you identify the incentives to innovate in the context of antitrust? Uh, in reviewing mergers, is there a reliable set of tools that um, policymakers can use to identify mergers that may impede innovation or alternatively uh, incentivize innovation? And if not, what are we to do? Well, in terms of, you know, what, what signals do we look for? You can look for um, basically three classes of evidence. There's the corporate documents. Uh, you can look at uh, theoretical analysis. You can look at uh, empirical analysis. Uh, an interesting issue is that uh, there's been a, a, a great deal of work that's been done on the economics of um, competition and innovation. Uh, and both on the empirical side and on the theoretical side. Some people say it's the second most tested relationship after the price structure relationship in economics. Uh, but there's not been a whole lot of work that's been done that is relevant to the types of enforcement levers that the antitrust agencies have. So in other words, competition and innovation is different from mergers and innovation, certainly different from what you might encounter in a Section 2 case. Uh, and so you, you, you need to tailor the evidence to what solutions that you have or the, 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 enforcement, um, uh, the enforcement instruments that you have. Now, um, there, there is another way of thinking about a, a whole class of innovation cases, which is potential competition theory. Uh, there, I, there are many cases and many traditional innovation cases, none of which, by the way, have ever been tested in court, which is an important caveat. Uh, there are many potential competition cases. Uh, the problem is that the, um, court, the agency's record on potential competition cases has not been very good. Uh, but I, I would argue that innovation cases are different. And if they did go to court, uh, assuming that the courts are not stuck in their old ways, which is a big assumption, uh, these cases should, should succeed. I'll give you an example. The FTC's challenge of the Thoratec hardware merger, where I was involved uh, as a consultant to the FTC, was, in my opinion, a, a very successful uh, challenge. Now, I think you gave me the opening to also talk about solutions. Um, uh, many. Uh, innovation cases are settled with remedies, uh, and particular merger, particularly merger cases. And even though the, the FTC and other enforcement agencies have conducted a lot of uh, uh, retrospective analyses of um, uh, merger remedies, they've been almost entirely focused on price effects. Uh, there's been very little uh, uh, sort of um, historical studies of innovation, the success of innovation remedies. Uh, I've done some work on this question, and the preliminary results are not at all encouraging. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, remedies uh, in merger cases that were supposed to address innovation concerns that turned out to be really unsuccessful. Uh, the assets went to someone who then either did not pursue the desired R&D at all, or the company went bankrupt and was bought by another company that also did not pursue uh, the desired R&D direction. Uh, this is a big problem, and, and what does it mean for merger policy? Well, uh, 
it doesn't mean one poss one one lesson might be to be more aggressive and not accept these consent decrees. But that actually doesn't work, because if you adopt a more aggressive stance in, in merger enforcement, what people are going to do, if they have overlapping activities that they can divorce from the deal and are not critical, essential for the deal, they'll fix the transaction first. And they'll do it with a, uh, eff effectively a spinoff uh, that has no reason why it would be more effective as an enforcement remedy than what the agency would have done. Uh, so it's really quite a dilemma. I do think that one area that is uh, promising, and it's actually related to the comments of, of other people in the panel, is um, a number of compulsory licensing obligations uh, have been pursued. And those, in my analysis, seem to have had um, generally positive effects uh, as, as a remedy. Thank you. Uh, anybody have a response, panel? Okay, uh, so uh, next question for Anne. Uh, so Rich spoke about the focus or the obsession with market definition in, in IP. Uh, the question of course is without market definition and in IP cases, um, in merger cases that focus on innovation, is there even a implication of Section 7 of the Clayton Act, if firms don't compete, do, um, can antitrust enforcement agencies uh, do anything about incentives to innovate? And in terms of competition, uh, if it, competition may happen 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're investing in something that where alternative technologies may or may not compete. Uh, so how do you apply uh, this analysis in merger cases if you don't know if uh, Section 7 is even applicable? Well, I think that's one of the risks that you run in trying to regulate or oversee innovation, um, that whenever you try to do so, it involves some manner of industrial policy. So you said what laws apply if the firms don't compete. Well, I think you have to think about your definition of competing. What, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean do they not compete in downstream product markets? Do you mean that they don't have competing strands of R&D, um, that they aren't uh, at least uh, attempting to reach the same customers, even if they're with very different approaches or different um, products and services? And I would say the answers to those questions um, inform then what policy can and cannot do, but nobody's going to have a crystal ball on, on how things are going to play out over time. And, and when it comes to potential competition, uh, I think it's a very risky proposition for any agency to try and, um, and, and step in to uh, uh, prevent um, activities that aren't even clear that they're going to come to pass. Okay, Rich? Yeah, I, you know, Will, William Baxter once wrote that um, uh, competition and mergers in particular uh, can affect competition in today's markets, tomorrow's markets, or in research and development to get from today to tomorrow. And, you know, all of these three, uh, there are all three possible effects. Antitrust policy has been overwhelmingly focused on today's markets. Uh, but the fact is there can be significant consequences in the other two, uh, at least as important as the consequences in today's markets. Um, but we need to be able to take some more risks in antitrust enforcement. Right now, I would characterize antitrust enforcement today as saying you have to be absolutely right because we, are, uh, we don't want to have any uh, make mistakes about over-enforcement of the antitrust laws. Well, what about under-enforcement of about the antitrust laws. Uh, that's a risk, too. Now, I'm not saying that we should uh, abandon standards of proof and just assume that every transaction raises a concern. That, of course, would be absurd. And particularly when you go farther and farther out, 
uh, into transactions that are many years off, which has happened with, uh, for example, in the European Commission has been doing some of this interventions. It gets very uncertain, and then you're really, you know, in the crystal ball uh, world. Uh, but we do need to take a few more risks. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The, there was um, a re not too distant case, the Nielsen Arbitron uh, transaction, um, which was challenged on uh, effects in a new market. And, um, you know, whether or not that was a good transaction or not, a good uh, enforcement action, it was a bit complicated. I don't want to get into the details. but. What I do want to say is Commissioner Wright wrote a, an interesting dissent in that transaction about the difficulties of challenging uh, uh, conduct or, or a merger that was going to have future effects. And I would agree with everything that Commissioner Wright wrote in that dissent. But if you take it literally, you, you can't block any merger that would have a future effect because there's always going to be uncertainties. And that would not be good policy, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Anyone else on that topic before we shift gears a little bit? No, okay. Um, I'm gonna pick on Anne a little bit more since she raised the issue of PAEs. Um, uh, in our uh, 2016 report, one of our findings was that um, uh, litigation PAEs engage in conduct that's consistent with nuisance litigation. And so I wonder if you could speak to what evidence we might have um, that uh, nuisance litigation by PAEs, what effect that might have on innovation, on follow-on innovation in particular. So I don't think there's been any empirical work on this yet, um, aside from the case study, um, the FTC case study that you're mentioning. And we were discussing this over lunch, actually. <laughs> I am, uh, frankly, a little skeptical. I understand that the nuisance value, the costs and the time and the distraction involved in litigation are a price that you have to pay for any uh, IPR, any patent, because it's valueless unless you can enforce it or have a threat of enforcement. So there's going to be some, in any but-for world, some baseline level of transaction costs related to getting sued, defending yourself, having to sue, having to pay for um, your arguments in court. The question I have in terms of the nuisance litigation and the nuisance PAEs is how prevalent they are within the economy. I know we can all probably come up with anecdotal evidence of an example here or an example there, but I think that's true for almost any kind of antitrust um, or, or policy issue that you can think of, that you're going to find um, one or two, and the question is, are those one or two representative of a large group or are they just exceptions? And if we're going to pursue policy that targets particular business models or um, makes it harder to litigate. Those have those kinds of policies have far-reaching repercussions um, across the ecosystem and affect people's incentives even in different business models. So I would want to see some solid empirical evidence that this is a widespread or at least a common problem that the nuisance lawsuits are dragging down small firms, preventing um, R&D investments, or preventing the ability to obtain financing, for example, um, in, a, in a fairly regular basis before I saw any policy, simply because I think the unforeseen circumstances could be quite detrimental, um, especially in areas of innovation where we know that innovation is, uh, incentives are created from all different kinds of uh, areas of the economy, and we, you just don't know how you're going to muck things up um, by, by clamping down here when maybe you kill innovation over here, so. Any others? Go ahead, Jim. So uh, there is empirical evidence about the effect of PAE litigation, and it's uh, the specific question of whether there's a detrimental effect from nuisance PAE litigation. It's hard because it's hard to define what it, what it, which any particular lawsuit is a nuisance case. So 
we should put it, I think, in the context of this, of, of the broader literature. There are several papers now that have used quasi-experimental uh, methods. Um, uh, Mezzanotti has a paper based on the eBay decision where he finds a, a reduction in R&D. Mezzanotti and Simcoe ha have another paper on the eBay decision and find no negative effects from the eBay decision. Cohn and et al. have a paper where they look, uh, they compare um, companies that uh, lost to a, a, a PAE or settled with a PAE compared to companies that won after they'd been uh, had a PAE demand, finding a, a, a loss in R&D. So there, there do seem to be um, some evidence, and I don't think it's conclusive or overwhelming, but there, there's some, some very significant evidence that PAE litigation has negative effects on, on, uh, on innovation, at least R&D spending and patenting, particularly by small firms. If I could follow up a little bit on that, I, uh, those papers are, they're very good papers, they're solid empirical papers, but they also are very clear about what their limitations are and what assumptions they're making. And so, for example, the Mezzanotti paper looks specifically at um, the eBay ruling and the removal of an automatic injunction. So that's a shift from a very extreme, strong IPR system to a more moderate one. And so I think you have to interpret those results in the context of the research that he was doing. It is what is the impact of removing automatic injunctions. It's not necessarily that all PAE litigation is bad. And, and, and like, likewise with the other PAE studies, I think you know, they're very careful in, in circumscribing what exactly the question they're asking is. And so you need to look at the assumptions, you need to look at the model they're running, um, rather than just lumping them all together and saying, yeah, there's this body of evidence. Yeah, Mezzanotti went beyond that. He, he compared uh, specifically uh, companies that were prone to, to, to PA litigation and not, and he found that PA litigation was significantly affected by the eBay decision. So he, he has an instrument. Um, yeah, and there, I there agree is, with there it, is but some, it's all about some, the injunction oh. question. So uh, this is uh, not really on the nuisance issue, but I, I, I can't resist saying uh, in the context of uh, the earlier session, which made some rather strong claims about how you know, the world would fall apart if we don't have strong intellectual property rights, uh, the, uh, the Mezzanotti and Simcoe paper uh, did look, as, as Ann said, about uh, injunctions and removing automatic automatic injunctions, and that's a pretty strong change in intellectual property rights, a weakening of intellectual property rights. And while it, it's hard to get conclusive empirical results because you don't really have any natural experiments, a lot of things are going on, but they couldn't find any evidence of any reduction in, in innovation, productivity, R&D effort uh, following the, uh, the eBay decision. If, if I could just add one more quick thing. I think there's not been enough, probably because it's too difficult, empirical work examining what happens when you start from a Western, well-developed country with a strong system of IPR and you reduce those rights. The Mezzanotti paper looks at, that, at one aspect of that because the eBay gave us this natural experiment. What happens when you go from automatic injunction to having to fulfill the four eBay factors. But the trickier question is, what if you take a system like the US and you start systematically weakening patent rights? And we don't know the answer to that question just because it's not been done and we don't have the empirical data for it. And uh, studies, empirical studies in other parts of the world look at the other side of the question, what happens when you start really low and you add. And so taken as a whole over a span of multiple decades, the empirical literature, I think, suggests that there's sort of this inverted U relationship between property rights and innovation, that if you have too little, improving them, strengthening them increases your innovation. Once you get past that sweet spot, you're on the downward slope. Automatic injunctions were probably on the right side of that curve, and so moving back took us back up towards the peak. Um, but there's not very much empirical work on that other side of the question as opposed to the one on the left. And, and the work that is done, I mean, you have to be really careful about the fact that you know, everything, everything is simultaneously determined. 
Uh, I always cringe when someone says, you know, we have strong intellectual property rights and we have an innovative economy and, you know, you look at these poor developing countries, they have weak intellectual property rights and they have, you know, they don't have the innovation like we do. Well, now if you're a country that's mostly using innovations and not really entrepreneurial to begin with, you probably don't want a strong intellectual property rights system. It makes more sense uh, to be uh, biased towards users rather than towards uh, uh, the IP creators. And um, you know, that doesn't mean that if you strengthen intellectual property rights, all of a sudden these countries would just have uh, you know millions of flowers in, in blooming. It's, it's, there are a lot of determinants. Okay. Great. And on, on, on that note, uh, very interesting exchange. We should move on to the next yeah. topic. You want to talk about pat I was going to do the patent quality. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we had a pretty extensive discussion this morning about patent quality, and um, from a legal perspective, or I should say, for, as from the perspective of an economist, it was very much in the legal weeds about patent quality. Um, but one of the themes that I heard this morning was about um, devoting more resources to patent examiners to improve um, examination. And what struck me about that conversation is you know, there's two ways that you can deal with patent quality, right? You could deal with it ex ante by devoting more resources to examiners, or you can deal with it ex post by weeding out um, the poor quality patents. So I don't know, Jim, if you can maybe talk about that balance and is sort of a zero error rate ex ante really the most efficient way to think about this or, you know, whatever thoughts you might have on that. Okay. Um, hmm. So it's more complicated than that, I think. Uh, it's not, um, we can talk about patent quality about certain things like uh, uh, novelty, one or two. Um, the, the question is, did the examiner do a good enough search? Uh, it, was there something out there that would invalidate that patent? Um, in, in that area, more resources or perhaps more technically astute resources or crowdsourcing. I mean, there's this new, new uh, movement where the, the, the uh, MIT Media Lab and some other sources have gotten together and are creating a prior art database for software patents. Um, you know, th those are encouraging things. But a lot of the problems with patent quality aren't, aren't so simple. They have to do with 103, they have to do which is, is inherent, or with, with issues, I think, of vagueness of, of what, the, what the definitions are, uh, of what the patent actually is, which, which by the way, in, relates to even, even simple novelty searches, so that if, if we're not clear what the boundaries are, uh, we can't be very clear on what the relevant prior art is. Um, so I, I always find this, this is sort of the Lemley discussion of rational ignorance. Do we want to, you know, put the resources up front or, or later? And, and I, find, I find it difficult because to a great degree, w we need to change how we're doing things in a more fundamental way, I think, to, to really solve some of the patent quality problems. Now that said, um, we are, when, when we get into a world where we see a whole business model based on well, arguably based on poor quality, or at least a poorly defined patents. I, I think that may be a better, a, a better description, patents which, which have vague boundaries or, or unclear boundaries. That's probably a sign that we need to put more resources into to, uh, to finding things early. But, but as I said, it's not just a matter of resources. I think it may be much more about it, what we're doing rather than how much we're doing it. Any others? Yeah, I'll jump in on this because I've been thinking about it you know, quite a bit uh, lately. And, uh, and this raises a classic question that we confront, and I'll put my lawyer hat on, and you know, from, from the law professor perspective, we think about this all the time. If we're going to you know, regulate, regulate in a loose sense, so do we want to do it ex ante? Do we want to do it ex post? Sort of a you know, more agency approach? Do we want to do, sort of rely more on you know, uh, courts after the fact? Um, that's not a unique question to the patent system. We confront it in the patent system. And I think the starting point is, you know, if we think that sort of, you know, that patent, the patent system is relevant for innovation incentives, then, um, you know, uh, we have these patentability standards that are meant to sort of reflect, you know, the balances that we sort of want to get right. 
And so, uh, and, and hopefully the patentability standards are set in a way to sort of properly reflect these balances. And then the question is, well, who's going to apply the patentability standards? And so this, this rational ignorance idea is essentially, you know, you know, maybe it's just more cost effective for society to sort of reserve more of those efforts for uh, the courts and less upfront. Um, I think it's, it's ultimately a cost benefit exercise. Um, and um, Professor Lemley, you know, nicely got this conversation started in a, in a law review article he wrote in 2001. And I think it was, it was a great discussion. Um, and I think it's certainly time to, to revisit the discussion because there was really uh, a lot that he, is, he was kind of assuming the answer on many things and actually sort of, you know, now we have sort of better data and better methods. We could actually try to estimate some of the parameters that he was simply assuming. And, and so Professor Wasserman, who was here uh, this morning in the first panel and I, have, we have a, a new paper where we're essentially revisiting this cost benefit exercise. And so you know, the, the analysis, it's, it's, you know, it's rich. We have to sort of think, well, if it's sort of a question of, do we, it almost sort of starts with the question, do we invest more in resources at the patent office right now to allow them to sort of do a better job in applying the patentability standards? Um, and those resources are gonna cost money, so like what are the cost of it? I mean, that's, you know, uh, our simulation analysis, we're really focusing on giving examiners more time because we, we, without getting into the details, we have, so, you know, we have an empirical sort of framework to be able to sort of estimate what's the effect of time that examiners are, are allocated on some of the outcomes that are relevant for this cost-benefit analysis. What was nice about the conversation this morning is not just thinking about resources in terms of time, but also in resources in terms of technologies available to do prior art searching and you know, uh, AI and related as well. So that, that could be part of it as well. But what, whether we invest in more time, and that would be more personnel expenses, um, you know, these are the types of costs that we're really gonna, uh, that we're really gonna have in the equation. You know, what are the savings that could come from sort of giving examiners more time? So, you know, the idea is if you've got this sort of trade-off between, you know, if we do more of a good job weeding out up front at the patent office, so one of the savings could be, well, we have less need for litigation uh, later on to the extent that litigation would otherwise be filling this residual role uh, of weeding out legally invalid patents. Um, and so then it raises the question, well, what are the litigation savings? And without getting into the weeds, we have, uh, we have our empirical framework to, uh, to be able to put some you know, estimates you know, into that. And then there's other savings as well, to the extent that if we think, you know, we take uh, the work by Glosser and Shankerman, we think that there might be some consequences of, uh, if there are legally invalid patents that are issued and might have effects on follow-on innovation, then the period of time between otherwise when the patent office would have knocked out this invalid patent before the court's getting around to it, there could be you know, uh, some social welfare costs there imposed in the, in, in, the, in the meantime. Those are much harder to quantify, so we left them kind of unquantifiable in our analysis, but um, with, well, even with what ultimately we could quantify on the cost side and what we could quantify on the savings side, we actually sort of, uh, uh, we think we come out suggesting that it would be beneficial to invest more on the margin in uh, the patent office as opposed to sort of relying uh, ex post on litigation. So we kind of come out counter to, uh, to what Professor Limley did. And, and it, much of what we can't quantify, we think only sort of reinforces that. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah, I, I should add, I mean, since 2001, litigation costs have soared. So, so many of the things that, that he was considering then are different now. Well, that's why the cost-benefit framework is such a nice one, right? Yeah. Because the costs are going to change over time, the benefits are going to change over time, and you can decide, I'm going to re reassess this every few years. Um, but just one other point on this particular question. I think there's a third avenue that, um, since we've mentioned them three times today, let's make it four, Galasso and Shankerman, um, they conclude on the basis of their empirical work that because these areas of blockage that, that the freeing up of R&D only uh, after a patent's invalidated only uh, emerges in very specific circumstances, they conclude that it's not a problem with the patent per se, but that it is contracting, right. that, the, that there are blockages between the ability of small firms to negotiate properly with the large firms who are holding these rights um, to come to <coughs> societally beneficial uh, outcomes. So, you know, let's not forget that that's, you know, a, a really valid avenue that should be explored and is there any role for policy in making those kinds of transactions easier? Clearly they're happening in lots of parts of the economy and it's only in these narrow areas that um, Galasso and Shankerman find the problems. Right. And I definitely agree with that. And so you would take, like with what we did with our analysis, take as given sort of what's there right now, but not to say that's not in the, you know, in the tool set of maybe also sort of trying to solve some of the contracting problems. I definitely completely agree. And okay. Also, I mean, people have said n narrow region a couple times here, and, and we're talking about computers, telecommunications, yeah. software, which is 
But right from about. large Apple firm patents. to small firms, it's not all of right, ICT. Right. It's narrow. They actually still had an average effect as well. Yeah. So, um, so I, it's yeah, there's still the average effect, but it's narrow when, it's when, they, when they broke it down. So, but it's a fair point. Okay, we're going to shift gears once again. Uh, the next question is uh, for Jim. Uh, you spoke about the importance of technology diffusion, uh, and presented some very compelling evidence. So the question is, is there a trade-off between technology diffusion and retaining sufficient incentives for original um, innovation? Sure, that, that, that's one of the, the basic, uh, did you have more? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and truly every invention is a follow-on innovation. Yeah. Um, so how do you, are we on the right side of the balance in the straight off? And uh, another question is whether we should have different policies for sequential innovation as opposed to original innovation. Okay. That's this, a lot of questions, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, would be, I was better off interrupting you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so one of the key theoretical things is yes, there, there's very much a trade-off that you can, in many cases, the, you know, you can give, give a greater right to an initial in inventor who can then license it to somebody uh, downstream who, and can, the, the initial inventor can uh, extract some rents from the downstream inventor and you want to play with that so both have optimal incentives. Um, and you're also right, this, this is complex because basically every invention, even in, in the power loop was an improvement of earlier things. Um, people had been playing with it for over a century. Um, and, and, and knowledge tends to be cumulative in, in inherently in so many, so many technical fields that, that, that there is this balance we have to achieve. Um, and and I, th I think this has been a very difficult area to get at. Uh, I think the in, one of the insights I have here, which is, I think I can say with some credibility that since two, the year 2000, when, when we see these gaps, what, what appear to be gaps in, in diffusion of technology, we're seeing a change for the worse. Because what, what we're seeing, on the one hand, the top firms are innovating as fast or actually faster than they were prior to 2000. So there's no shortage of innovation incentives for them. Uh, they have the incentives and they are innovating and their productivity is going up. What we're seeing that's worse is everybody else is so much behind. Now, how we solve that and what exactly is causing it and what the choke points are and what any policy would look, those are complicated questions I can't answer. But I think I, think I can say enough to say that um, things have gotten worse in the last 15 years or so. Rich? So in terms of what can be done in this area, what should be done, I want to look to history a little bit. Uh, there's a very nice paper by Will Tom, who spent many years at the uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, also at the Antitrust Division. And, and the paper is on a 1975 um, Xerox consent decree uh, negotiated by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and his, his premise is, was a very interesting one, which was that uh, this was a consent decree that had very little um, legal basis. That is, you could criticize it and say, what was the basis for this intervention? Uh, on the other hand, it seemed spectacularly successful. Uh, it opened up the market for xerography, uh, led to all kinds of new competitors, uh, small firms becoming larger firms, increased productivity by every dimension. Uh, we also have other examples, the 1959 uh, IBM consent decree, the 1959 uh, or it might have been 56, 56 AT &T. yeah, AT&T consent decree. You know, most people who have looked at these consent decrees say that they have really done pretty uh, positive things uh, for the industry. Uh, and uh, it suggests to me that, this, that we really do have this problem of sequential innovation that, uh, that protecting the original innovator uh, to the maximum extent, that's fine for the original innovator, but what about all the follow-on innovations that often account for at least as much, or as Jim said, many, 
many times as much uh, in terms of economic output as the original innovator did. Uh, and, um, and, and there are things we can do. It's just we haven't done anything since in the, like this really since 1975. Anybody else? Well, if you did things like that on a regular basis and it was semi-predictable, then we'd have to do another round of empirical research because if you're anticipating that, would you have had the Xerox and the AT&T? And I, it's an interesting question. Yeah, no, I, mean, I agree with you about you, you can't have maximum power that then you're on the wrong side of the of the curve. Exactly, you're on the wrong side of the curve. Uh, the uh, but in terms of the predictability issue, yeah, sure. If you know, if everybody who succeeded then had to license all the intellectual property, but I just don't think many people would really be deterred from innovating if they said when. You know, when you become the next AT and T, you might have an anti. If I if I get a decade of those returns first, I'd probably still do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there, I mean, it, these are histor interesting historical examples. In the AT and T case, there's an exec AT and executive, AT and T executive at the time who wrote uh, about how, you know, this was like, uh, I think this, the phrase was spreading bread on the water. That it, it produced all sorts of innovations that AT and T would have never thought of, and they thought. He actually thought it was a good thing. And similarly, some people have argued that the IBM unbundling that, that came apart about in part because of the, the consent decree um, was something that IBM probably would have done anyway, given enough time, but that the consent decree hastened it. So we're not necessarily talking about giving away the crown jewels in, 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 in a sense that uh, it's, it's often portrayed. Yeah, and uh, I think it was Noyce at, at, uh, at Intel said the AT&T consent decree was the best thing that ever happened to the industry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then the CEO of Xerox said that the Xerox consent decree ultimately was a good thing for the industry. It's so, uh, so a speaker in the last panel suggested that uh, innovation in the computer industry actually increased after the Alice decision. Uh, is there any economic support for this claim? And if so, what does that tell you about the role of patents in uh, promoting innovation, uh, technology diffusion, and do patents actually play a positive or a negative role in technology diffusion? Hmm. Question for well, Jim and others. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't hear the first part. The, we, the Alice decision was, a, had an effect on what? So the speaker at the previous panel suggested that the Alice decision had a positive effect on innovation in the computer industry. So I mean, I think that's it's conceivable to the to the extent that uh, it it um, the, uh, from my point of view. Sorry about that. Um, from my point of view, the. Um, the Alice decision was not related to any real innovations. Most of the things that were wiped out by Alice could have also been wiped out by a, a strict 103 non-obviousness determination. These were, it, do it on a computer basically. It's something we already know how to do, let's do it on a computer. Um, so it, it's hard to see how it would have uh, affected innovation adversely to the extent that uh, Alice patents were being used by PAEs and these were burdening small innovative firms, I could see that it would have a positive, possibly have a positive effect. I haven't seen any empirical work on that question, but um, anecdotally I've heard that it, Alice actually increased uncertainty um, because there was a lot of confusion over how it was going to be applied and where it was going to be applied. And um, uh, I heard some, uh, examples of, if you looked at patent X, which has been hugely um, successful commercially and spurred all kinds of follow-on innovation, if you evaluated it under um, the new Alice rule, you wouldn't know if you'd be able to get that patent and whether it would be valid today. So I, I think from what I've heard, again, anecdotally not um, statistically valid, but that it increased uncertainty and that, that could have a detrimental impact on innovation. So, and on the question of um, whether patents actually have a 
positive or a negative effect on technology diffusion? Anybody have any uh, thoughts? Well, oh, go ahead. I, I do th again, it, it relates to this issue of sequential innovation. If you believe in, if, you know, if you're a strong believer in sequential inno innovation, then um, the desirability of creating an ecosystem uh, and lowering uh, for innovation and lowering barriers to entry into that ecosystem is desirable. So I mentioned, you know, in the context of the AT&T consent decree, it was actually Gordon Moore who, who said it was the best thing that happened to semiconductors. Uh, but, um, you know, clearly no one wants to do away with intellectual property. Well, I, some people do, but I don't think it's really a, a credible proposal to say that we're going to do away with intellectual property completely. But at the same time, we have these, it's almost these two religious extremes. One is, you know, we don't have, need any intellectual property rights. That's wrong, clearly. But then this other extreme, which is uh, uh, innovation is maximized as long uh, as an increasing function of the strength of intellectual property rights. That's wrong as well. The optimal balance is somewhere in the middle. A lot of it has to do with quality issues or, or really scope or vagueness issues. So. Uh, the ability to, of the original inventor to extract too much from the follow-on inventors uh, is, is, is increased when patents are interpreted very broadly, which will happen when they're very vague. Um, so when we have a, a regime where we're issuing far too many vague patents in certain areas like software, uh, we may very well be giving too much power uh, to the upstream inventor and too, too little uh, leeway to, to the downstream inventor. There is some empirical evidence um, on historical data from Petra Moser, uh, who looks at the change in the 1870s and the ability to um, reverse engineer chemical inventions. So there were certain technological advances like the periodic table and some other things I can't remember uh, <laughs> that made it far easier to um, reverse engineer chemical in innovations and inventions. And what she found was then a shift towards patenting away from trade secrets in that industry and she confirmed that there was a broadening of diffusion of technology as measured by um, the geographic uh, uh, localization of innovative activity around the, the focal point of the patent. So that's at least a historical example of patents um, increasing diffusion over the alternative of trade secrets. Of course, it, it always depends on what else you were going to use, um, whether it's trade secrets or something else. But that's also an example of being at you know, one end of the spectrum. Right. No patent protection. Right. Uh, trade secrecy with no disclosure whatsoever, moving to patents disclosure. with disclosure. Yeah. And, and I think also critically, the, the periodic table and the other developments Petra talks about helped produce very sharply defined patents that were not ex excessively broad or excessively vague. So I want to pick up a little bit on um, the work that Petra Moser did, and also we've mentioned quite a bit already um, the work by Galasso and Schenkerman on sequential innovation. So I think, I think the two combined tell a pretty interesting story. So we have um, the work of Galasso and Schenkerman saying that patents have some um, potentially negative effect on following innovation, on follow -on innovation, but that this varies by industry. And then we have Petra Moser's work saying, well, patent protection is important, but it varies by industry, right? And even if you sort of tie that back to um, Galasso and Shankerman, right, that the, that the patents affecting um, follow-on innovation weren't really an issue for something like chemicals where we can really easily define the patent or, or the, the boundaries of the patent and that there aren't really a lot of alternatives for protecting that innovation relative to software where maybe the boundaries are a little bit more vague and there may be alternatives to protecting that innovation like copyrights, for example. And so, um, I don't know, maybe Michael, you want to take this. Um, does, does this sort of literature then suggest that maybe really in the, in the, um, in the patent system, we ought to be thinking of designing um, uh, IP rights in such a way that they vary by industry, that we maybe, you know, this sort of one-size-fits-all um, IPR policy is, is, not, is not really the most efficient. Right. And 
I mean, there's, there's I guess, a, a ton with that question. I mean, um, there was a big lead in. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, too, to the extent that also you don't have to be all or nothing with, with what type of IPR system you have to the extent that you've got, um, you know, a patent system alongside, you know, the ability to have, you know, trade secrecy as well that you might just get kind of uh, sorting by industry you know, into uh, maybe sort of the desired, uh, to, to the desired you know, um, you know, protection regime. Um, and then and we, we ask this question sometimes in, in, uh, in the patent context a lot, should, should the patent policy be uh, industry specific, focusing specifically on, uh, on the patent side? And, and I'll just say that I've just been kind of a casual consumer of these topics that have not said it. I'm not remotely a, an expert in this. And, um, and then I also defer to, uh, uh, to my more patent law uh, colleagues on this. But sometimes my patent law colleagues would even tell me, yeah, you, we have sort of like a unitary yeah, patent system um, and when you look in the doctrines, they may not sort of speak so specifically to industries, but I think that the reality is in practice, they have still like taken on uh, you know, industry specific you know, treatments. Um, and I would sort of defer the, the, uh, to the commission to uh, defer the commission to sort of look to work by uh, uh, Mark Lemley and Dan Burke, who I think sort of written a lot on this particular point. And just you know, there's certain doctrines that have just they play out in practice differently in some. You know, written description may play out differently in some uh, in some ministries relative to others, and I think they may also sort of tell us that even the notion of a, a facita, a facita uh, you know, person having ordinary skill in the arc already inherently sort of builds in flexibility that is in part sort of industry specific uh, as it relates to sort of how we apply uh, uh, non obviousness. Um, and so I think you know, one answer might be in part is already even that by its face it might seem so unitary, but when you uncover a, a little bit, there's there's some more specific uh, you know, industry uh, specific uh, you know, uh, patterns that are actually playing out. That might still not be sufficient to those who think that it ought to be more industry specific. Um, some uh, people often point to oh, the fact that patent terms are it's kind of we're kind of unitary in, in, in patent terms, um, and that might seem nonsensical for a number of reasons. Um, Professor Sakatmi, he was he was over there and he's gone now, but he uh, he was a panelist earlier in the day. He's done some interesting work showing differential sensitivities across industries to uh, to patent terms. Um, uh, uh, ben Rowan at MIT has written uh, quite a bit about this and then did some, uh, uh, some follow-on empirical work uh, uh, with Heidi Williams and, um, um, uh, uh, and I think Ben Rudish. Um, uh, looking even within pharma, even with looking within one industry, you can get some, some you know, distortions behavior to the extent we have sort of a unitary, uh, a unitary patent term. So I think that there could be, uh, I mean, we have these discussions about there could still be sort of a lot of, you know, potential social welfare improvements from kind of, you know, more sufficiently tailoring uh, our, our patent system. But my, my comment is, you know, there's probably more of it going on that might sort of, you know, initially be, uh, you know, perceived. Um, and then we as economists, we could talk about we can do a lot more. I wish there's, you know, uh, the lawyers could sort of also correct me more. We also run into some various constraints on sort of how much we can do in this. I think trips might be sort of a constraint and sort of how much you can do on, on varying across industries. Uh, and I'm not remotely an expert on, on that particular question. Um, I'll stop there and kick it off to anybody else. If have other thoughts. I just want to add a caveat. Do not underestimate the creativity of patent drafters. So you may try to make things industry specific. They will be creative. They will figure out ways to make this thing in this industry sound like that thing in that industry if the protection is better over there. So it's just a risky proposition. Right, and I, I'll even add to that, and it's really probably the, the PTO experts in the room uh, could speak better to this. I think that there had been some PTO practices to try to target specific art units, like uh, I think second pair of eye review might be sort of one particular example, and what you saw are sometimes, I think, applicants, and it might be, and I, I think that John Allison and Mark Limley had some uh, paper on this, so that might be totally wrong in my recollection of that, but seeing applicants like try to actually sort of, uh, well, otherwise sort of like, you know, kind of, Respond in a way to sort of you know to to move uh, where they think ultimately where they're you know an art unit to the extent they it might be difficult for them to sort of control that but there might have been a behavioral response uh, 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 you know, and an attempt to try to uh, you know to affect sort of essentially sort of you know what you know what art unit is really going to be uh, reviewing their uh, their application and so I definitely agree with well don't rule out sort of the uh, you know the, uh, the craft it is of a the game you have to game. you have to use game theory and I, I think you can look at history for examples right back back when um, software patents had to have some physical embodiment then you saw software patents that were disguised as pizza ovens so <laughs> people are creative anyone else um, so 
a number of commentators have suggested that um, using alternative mechanisms such as prizes or contests or crowdsourcing um, uh, to incentivize innovation. So is there any support in the economics literature to suggest that these alternative mechanisms might actually be effective in inducing innovation, perhaps relative to patents or other ways of protecting innovation? I don't know. Who wants to start with that? Uh, Jim, do you want to take that one? Well, there have been some nice things done, both historical um, and, and some more recent ones. Finding, yes, uh, so these can be effective innovation mechanisms. It's not clear that they're necessarily alternatives to the patent system. They may be complements to it. Um, and, and that's part of, I think, the design. But it's, it's very clear there's some areas where the, the current regime does not address innovation well. and, and uh, Prizes, uh, you know, and some of these other mechanisms um, uh, may be very important. Trade secrecy, of course, is huge, and we, we always kind of forget about that, but probably the majority of innovations are protected by trade secrecy rather than anything else. Zarina Khan has some really nice papers on um, historical data on prizes and medals and contests. And she points out the rent-seeking behavior that those kinds of mechanisms, incentive mechanisms, can create. Both the rent-seeking to get on the committee to name who, who wins these things and the rent-seeking to obtain the awards. And in some instances, what she found was that the really highly valued most pioneering inventions were getting patents, and it was the Me Too's or the less inventive ones that got the awards because they, they didn't have the incentives to get the patents, whereas the ones who wanted the market value did um, because there's very little uh, correlation between what the prize um, value is versus what the societal value of the innovation may be, or that the prizes were given to people who were gaming the system and getting patents too, and maybe getting prizes in multiple countries and from multiple entities in addition to their patents. So it's, it's not clear that those um, kinds of mechanisms are a silver bullet. I, I would agree with Jim that they're that you might want to think about them, if at all, as, as complementary to the um, IPR protection system that you already have, but be very careful in how you define those prizes and medals and, and think about how you're creating incentives. And I was just I think on some of this empirical literature, I think they've supported this complement, you know, complementary uh, uh, idea to the extent that they found, uh, I just remember, actually, I kind of forget the, the authors, but some studies looking at um, the, the Royal Agricultural Society of England and some prizes that they were given out from sort of mid 18th, you know, 19th century to the early 20th century. It was like a long period of many decades of prizes they were given out. Um, and then they were, you know, the, the, some of the punchlines of their analysis was, I mean, there does seem to be sort of, you know, entry into innovation re resulting from the prizes, but then ultimately sort of, you know, kind of fed over into sort of the patent system, at, you know, uh, subsequently. Um, and so I do think there's some, even some empirical support to the, you know, to the idea that they can sort of you know, work as complements to each other. It also, in the sense of sequential innovation, we, we, we need to distinguish between the big inventions and the incremental in, in, in inventions. And it's often, you know, Zarina focused on, the, on the, the major inventions, but that doesn't mean the minor inventions were to be ignored. And in fact, if you look at the power loom, the big invention was really a very small part of the total productivity gain. It was mostly from those minor minor improvements, many of which were probably unpatentable, many of which, some of which were patented, some of which were not patented, uh, and some of which were, um, you know, may well have been uh, enhanced by a prize. Okay, so uh, we had a number of questions from the audience. Uh, we only have time for one. Um, <laughs> Time is running short. This question is uh, for Rich and others uh, can weigh in. 17 years ago, uh, Rich, you and Tom Will asked if innovation is king at antitrust agencies. And do you think we've made progress since then? Um, interesting question. Um, there's progress in the sense that innovation concerns are very commonly raised in uh, antitrust cases in high technology industries. And in fact, um, since about, um, I don't know, since the turn of the century, uh, it's really been almost 100% uh, in, in terms of complaints. Uh, if there's a complaint in a merger case alleging 
harm to innovation in a high-tech industry, it's also going to include uh, an allegation of harm to innovation. Uh, so it, it, it certainly has, uh, the innovation's concerns are more prominent, but they have not been really pivotal yet uh, with a couple of very, only a few exceptions at most. And the question is, um, you know, when are we going to really uh, step up and say, this is a concern in this case. Uh, it's not just a price concern. It really is an innovation concern and be prepared to, to, to litigate. Uh, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. And uh, we are making progress, uh, but we haven't yet seen uh, an agency actually take it to court on a fundamentally innovation-based theory. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, let's take a little bit of time um, where each person, each panelist will give a short statement of policy recommendations, your overall conclusions, takeaways. Uh, we'll start with Rich. Okay, I just, if I may, I'd like to just, we've had sort of two main themes. One is the um, innovation theme, but the other is the intellectual property and protection and sequential innovation. Uh, on the latter, I just want to briefly repeat my concern that you, you can't equate intellectual property strength to innovation. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, uh, you know, we don't know if people innovate because there are strong intellectual property rights or if there are strong intellectual property rights because people innovate. And, you know, both are factors. And uh, some of the work that's been discussed here, I think, provides nuances on that that are important to appreciate. Um, on the uh, innovation area, uh, you know, we just talked about whether the agencies will step up on innovation. And I want to point and, and in terms of what can the agencies do, um, the Federal Trade Commission in particular has had, uh, in my opinion, an admiral record of um, being on uh, the edge of, in my opinion, positive antitrust enforcement actions. For example, reverse payments. Uh, you know, there was a time when it was the scope of the patent. And if you were in the scope of the patent, you could do anything you wanted with the patent. And the Federal Trade Commission really led the charge to say that, you know, many of these reverse payment cases are, are, are like disguised mergers and raise significant competition concerns. And the agency faced enormous headway in bringing those cases, but the agency persevered. And now it's, you know, they don't, you don't win all of these reverse payment cases, but it's, I think they've gotten the courts to understand that reverse payments are, are a very significant competitive issue. Uh, similarly with standard essential patents and injunctions. And I think the agencies can do the same on innovation. Uh, and in particular, the, the Federal Trade Commission can, uh, you know, by bringing strong cases like Thortec hardware, uh, where it was a very clear innovation case. It, the, the parties abandoned the transaction, but I think if you took that one to court, you could well have won it. And, uh, and, and hopefully you will continue to you know, bring the right cases and bring them because they're right, even if they don't fit the law in, in exactly the precise way the law has been constructed. Thank you. Jim? So I guess my main point is that we need to think about innovation policy, uh, not just about the initial innovations, but about the, the whole sequence of innovations and, and cumulative knowledge development. Um, and this requires a sort of a broader perspective on policy um, and maybe some policy areas that we don't traditionally think about when we're thinking about innovation. Um, in patents, uh, it may mean uh, some ways of improving patent quality, so we're, we're narrowing scope or vagueness. And, and Rich raised some interesting ideas about compulsory licensing that might be relevant. Um, 
In trade secrecy law, I think the, there's growing evidence that things like the in inevitable disclosure doctrine uh, may be problematic from the points of, point of view of employee mobility. And this tremendous rise in non-compete agreements in employment law uh, is, is a factor affecting employment mobility. And, and employment mobility, uh, I think we have some good, good evidence, is, is often key to um, uh, a sequential innovation, cumulative innovation. It allows people to start new companies. It allows people to transfer knowledge from one place to another. So I, I, I would say we need a broader perspective often when we think about innovation. Thank you. Uh, Michael? And, and I really I quite like that idea, thinking you know, more broadly and thinking about you know, um, other things that we, you know, uh, uh, sort of other policy approaches, and maybe some that sort of you know, relate to sort of employment mobility. And, um, and uh, I, I echo some of the, uh, the, the views about compulsory licensing. I, licensing. I'll probably specifically sort of just discuss you know, probably what I'm more comfortable discussing, which is actually the issue of, uh, of patent quality, just because I spent much more time um, thinking about and doing research in this particular area. Um, and uh, again, I just emphasize not to the exclusion of other you know, great ideas when stepping back and thinking you know, more broadly. But at least as it you know, comes to like, at least the, the two, like some of the questions that were, were to some extent posed to me today, well, you know, should we think about sort of more you know, um, technology-specific tailoring of the patent system, or should we think about sort of you know, making improvements in patent quality at, you know, at, at the patent office? I, I, I tend to think sort of what's kind of focused more on, on, on the latter, maybe in part because we, we, we might have a stronger evidence base there right now, and it might be sort of more tractable, uh, attractable and also maybe you know, uh, more legally feasible. Um, uh, but you know, so much of what I'll say here is this, I, it's, it's really much of what was discussed, I would say, sort of in the first panel today. And, and first, I think it often starts with sort of a good you know, adoption of a definition of what, what patent quality is. And, and I probably just really defer to a, a, the nice statement by Professor Marco earlier today. And then first of all, I think we should think about it in terms of patent quality not in terms of you know, value in some sort of economic sense so much as sort of you know, the legal validity of the patent to the extent that those patentability standards are, are at least hopefully set properly with uh, you know, the, the, the types of uh, big picture balances that we do have in mind. But so quality in terms of validity of the patents that are issued by the patent office and also uh, sort of the, the less, less vagueness, you know, more certainty uh, you know, uh, uh, with these patents and you know, to try to push for not just passable patents, as Professor Marco said, but let's try to sort of push towards you know, A plus patents. And are we there yet? So, so do we know exactly what to do. Uh, I think, in part, you know, we start to have some ideas. Um, you know, and again, Professor Wasserman and I have been trying to advocate certain ideas. One is it sort of just relates to the question of you know, ex ante versus ex post, investing more resources in the patent office. Or is it, should we just not care about quality that comes out of the patent office because the courts will just sort of deal with it later on? Uh, and again, I sort of you know, at least feel relatively strongly at this point that we actually do. I think we ought to sort of think much more closely about uh, the quality at the patent office. Um, and I will say we've made uh, nice strides in recent years in part by the great uh, data dissemination efforts that have come out of the, uh, the office of the chief economist uh, at the patent office. And Professor Marker yeah, there's a lot of credit for that. And so I, I, uh, kudos to that, and uh, hopefully we, we, we keep seeing more of that moving forward. And then also, uh, we talked about this, in, well, they talked about this in the first panel today, uh, it'd be nice to see some more experimentation um, so that some of the tools that we have with, uh, with, with fee setting authority uh, and with other sort of parameters of the system, that we, we might have a better sense about how to, uh, um, you know, how to tweak them moving forward uh, that might be informed by um, not just the observational data that we've been producing, but maybe some you know, uh, uh, information coming out of uh, uh, targeted experiments you know, at the office. But um, so my suggestions are to sort of, uh, which are uh, uh, consistent with already sort of very strong uh, desires to sort of improve uh, uh, quality uh, of, of the, uh, at the patent office to sort of, uh, you know, I just, uh, I say I, I endorse many of those efforts. Thank you. Anne? Um, I think given the complexity of the issues that we're talking about, how IPRs of all types, patent quality, patent scope, copyright, trademark, trade secret, et cetera, and the ability, <coughs> excuse me, of all the parties within uh, a given industry or a given market area to react to one another and re-react, that theory only gets us so far. So my main policy recommendation would be encouraging additional empirical research. The panel right before us talked about all the different uh, reforms, both legislative, um, different rulings at the courts, uh, experiments at the USPTO, et cetera. We should be using those as a springboard to test empirically 
what happens when these things did? What happens to this constituency versus that constituency? What were the unintended consequences? I think we just can't barrel ahead on the basis of theory that we really do need more uh, empirical research on, on these fields. Thank you. Uh, I think that concludes today's panel, uh, but don't go away yet. Uh, we have a um, speaker to close the hearings. We're, we're honored to have um, closing remarks by Commissioner Rebecca Kelly Slaughter. Commissioner Slaughter was sworn in as a Federal Trade Commissioner on May 2nd, 2018. Uh, prior to joining the commission, she served as chief counsel to uh, Senator Charles Schumer of New York, the Democratic Senate leader. A native New Yorker, she advised Leader Schumer on legal competition, telecom, privacy, consumer protection, and intellectual property matters, um, among other issues. Prior to joining Senator, Senator Schumer's office, Ms. Slaughter was an associate in the DC office of Sidley Austin. Uh, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Slaughter. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here to close two productive days of hearings about innovation and intellectual property. Before I begin, I want to note the usual disclaimer that I will be expressing my own views only and not those of the commission or any other commissioner. Uh, I will also apologize because I ran over here from headquarters and got a little winded. So I'm sorry <laughs> if I'm uh, speaking a little quickly. So I want to commend all of the FTC staff who worked very hard to put together these thoughtful panels. And thank you to the many panelists and presenters for contributing to the Commission's re-examination of the state of antitrust and consumer protection law. I'm particularly pre pleased that Drew Hirschfeld, the Commissioner of Patents, and the Honorable Scott Bullock, the Acting Chief PTAB Judge, joined us earlier today. The FTC and PTO have had a long-standing and invaluable working relationship. We have much to learn from each other so that we can both improve how we use our tools to foster innovation. The conversations at these hearings over the past two days were extremely animated. As I learned working on IP issues on the Hill for many years, intellectual property can get pretty spicy. I used to find the depth of emotion and passion around IP perplexing. At first glance, these issues seemed like they should be much less emotionally and politically fraught than the policy areas that more directly implicate life or liberty. And yet I found them to be equally, if not more, charged. But intellectual property is fundamentally about the right and incentive to create, and the potential to foreclose others from the fruits of that creative process. It is hard to imagine anything more personal than the ability to have an ownership right in the work of one's own mind. Whether you believe IP needs to be strengthened to promote creativity, or that IP rights are abused to stifle it, you are likely to care very much about the policy being applied properly to allow human intellectual potential to thrive. All of that is to say, I get the passion and I appreciate the energy we have seen displayed here today and yesterday. One of the many reasons I am so excited to be here, both at the Commission generally and here today at these hearings specifically, is because the FTC has long been at the forefront of tackling difficult questions of how intellectual property rights intersect with competition and consumer protection. At the heart of these questions is something of a paradox. IP law and antitrust law share a common goal, the promotion of innovation. But at the same time, IP can seem in conflict with competition policy because intellectual property is fundamentally about the opportunity to exclude competitors, a concept that generally invites scrutiny under antitrust law. Let me start by saying a word about the common goal of IP and antitrust, innovation. Each type of IP protection grants an exclusive ownership interest to the rights holder with a level of exclusivity tailored to the specific nature of each type of IP in order to encourage innovation without stifling competition. The balance is not the same for research intensive patent inventions as it is for the creative arts in copyright, for example. Whatever the nature of the specific right, each type of intellectual property promotes innovation and benefits consumers, and competition law is designed to do exactly the same. 
Our competition laws promote innovation by ensuring that firms do not exercise their market power, whether it is supported by intellectual property or otherwise, to thwart competition through anti-competitive conduct or consolidation. Often this work does not involve IP specifically, such as in many merger reviews. The FTC and DOJ first recognized that a merger could harm innovation when they included a section on innovation effects in the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. Since then, the FTC has brought several cases that include allegations of harm to innovation. And I want to talk about one good example of these efforts, which was the Commission's challenge to the merger of CDK Global and Automate, two firms that provide business software for car dealerships. CDK Global was attempting to acquire Automate, a competitor, that while smaller in terms of market share, was a particularly innovative and disruptive challenger to the two market leaders. In this case, harm in the form of reduced innovation was a prominent feature of the FTC's inquiry, alongside allegations that the merger would result in increased prices and diminished quality of services. In the face of the court challenge from the FTC, the parties abandoned the deal. The FTC should continue its careful scrutiny of deals with the potential to reduce innovation and be ready and willing to challenge a merger even when the facts show that the prevailing and perhaps only harm is to innovation. In many cases, competition law and IP law run peacefully in tandem and are even complementary in promoting innovation and competition. However, we wouldn't be here today discussing innovation and IP if that was the end of the story. The most interesting and difficult questions to me arise when there is an overlap or a conflict between the application of intellectual property rights and the healthy operation of a competitive marketplace. In examining restraints on competition, the FTC considers not only the IP matter at hand, whether that be patent, copyright, trademark, or trade secret related, but it focuses on the impact the exercise of that property right will have on competition and consumers. As the Supreme Court held in activists, a patent does not provide a free press from antitrust scrutiny, and patents aren't the only area of challenge. Yesterday, we had a terrific panel about copyright, the Commission's first of this kind, with discussions about how copyright law intersects with competition and consumer issues in various forms of media and online platforms. As content is increasingly and often exclusively digital, there are many new challenges that I'm glad to see these hearings addressing head on. How properly to identify the line between where the right to exclude promotes innovation and where it inhibits competition and therefore innovation is extremely challenging and extremely important. These questions have only become more difficult with 21st century innovations in data sharing, online platforms, and the ubiquity of software. I'm not the only one who thinks it's hard. We've seen case after case out of the Supreme Court on IP that each raise more questions than they seem to answer. That is why I'm glad these hearings have devoted two, difficult, two days to difficult IP questions and so grateful our panelists have donated their time and intellect to helping us think through these issues. While the Commission has been very engaged in some specific areas of IP study, advocacy, and enforcement, this week's sessions have been an opportunity to take a step back and reconsider the fundamental questions of competition, innovation, in, and intellectual property. Participants throughout both days have shared their views on major trends in the IP landscape, including how businesses make IP decisions, copyright challenges, patent quality, and patent litigation. Some of the debates sounded very familiar to me from my days working on these issues in the Senate, but there are of course new developments, new law, and new empirical studies that are continuing to inform the conversation. This week's hearings reaffirm the critical role the FTC plays in bringing its competition and consumer protection expertise to help tackle key innovation and intellectual property questions. As I said when I opened the second day of hearings, it is simply not plausible that, when we, that we conclude this effort with a pat on the back, telling ourselves that we've gotten everything right so far. Surely we will be able to distill key lessons that will inform our enforcement and policy priorities, and certainly there will be more to consider as IP markets and competition evolve. Thank you again for having me, and again, thank you to all of us who provided, all of you who provided us with two days of thought-provoking and spirited discussions. Thank you very much. I think that concludes today's hearings. Thank you. <laughs>